Emerald Blockchain Forum. I'm Jeff Sandy, President of Sandy and Strategies and one of the tri chairs of the Blockchain Forum Committee, along with John West, right there, and Mark Rasmussen, who's in front of us. John is principal at Air State Blockchain Consulting, and Mark is a partner at John State. Before we get started, I um, want to announce that there is a reception afterwards. So, depending on when we end, we have the we have receptions in this room till about 5:45. Water, tea available. You can meet the speakers and continue the conversation. For those of you who aren't familiar with Tech Titans, it's the largest trade association for technology companies in North Texas, with about 300 corporate members. Tech Titans' vision is to champion and serve the tech community across North Texas, and it's carried out through by encouraging innovation, creating business opportunities, recognizing excellence in the tech community, and programs like this one today from the Special Interest Forum. Before we begin, I want to say thank you to the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas for allowing us to use their facilities for this program. It's always a pleasure to come down here and, and have an event. Yeah, time went well in advance, but, but they do a nice job for us. We're also pleased to announce today that we have a new sponsor for the Blockchain Forum, and that's Accenture. Uh, they're now a presenting sponsor for the Blockchain Forum, and I'd, I'd like now to introduce Don McKenzie, and to say a few words about, you want Rich to say it? Okay, Rich, step on up here. Don's passing. Say a few words about Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rich Mazaros. I'm a managing director um, at Accenture, and I'm out of our Dallas office. And uh, as mentioned, we are uh, extremely pleased to be sponsoring Tech Titans um, this year, and specifically around the blockchain, uh, the blockchain track. Um, blockchain is something at Accenture that we are uh, we see as very significant and strategic. And as we help our uh, clients around the world. Uh, transform their businesses, blockchain has a significant role. And so it's important to our business and we're, we're pleased to be a part of this event and uh, to sponsor Tech Titans this year. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Let's go. And we really appreciate having you on board. It's, it's awesome. All right. So, uh, in your program, you'll see a list of upcoming events once a month, and some other special things that we'll talk about later. With respect to the program, um, blockchain has been impacting banking, traditional banking, under the surface. We've, we've noticed that since Bitcoin peaked in price and fell, there's not as much publicity going on about blockchain, but there's a lot of things going on underneath the surface. Developments happening, and we're going to find out about that today. Specifically in the area of banking, um, today we're going to be talking about decentralized identity, tokenizing assets, streamlining the underwriting and process for syndicated loans, and the integration of digital currencies into the traditional payment system. We have an outstanding panel of experts to talk about this today. Um, starting with Rich, we have, we, have, we have Rich Mazaros, Managing Director for IoT at Accenture. JC Jalant is the Senior Product Manager for Venestro. And Eric Smith is the Founder and CEO of App Brilliance. Our moderator today is Sonia Aziz. Sonia works right here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas as an Outreach Analyst. Ladies and gentlemen, Sonia Aziz was going to get us started with the program. Intro. I'd like to formally welcome everyone here to the Dallas Fed, um, especially those if it's your first time. I'm sure security already gave you a nice warm welcome, but I'll give you another one. Um, our 
panelists will be giving short presentations about their main focus areas, just to make sure that everyone's caught up to speed and on the same page. Um, and then we will get into questions. But I wanted to do a little bit more of an intro to each of our panelists before we get started. So first up, we're going to have Rich presenting. Um, he currently serves as Managing Director and Global Lead of Industry Digital Transactions. Over the last four years, Rich has led the emerging blockchain practice within the Center Digital. He works with clients to identify and explore innovative use cases for the application of blockchain and distributed ledgers, ledgers to design tomorrow's emerging commerce experience. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Next, you'll hear from JC. JC has over 25 years of experience with financial technology innovations across software vendors and institutional banks. Finestra is the largest fintech company in Europe and the third largest in the world, with 48 of the world's top 50 banks by asset size as their clients. After JC, Eric will lead the discussion further into the world of cryptocurrency. Eric is a software industry veteran with over 25 years of startup experience. Eric is the principal architect and inventor of the company's patented technologies that address critical gaps integrating cryptocurrencies and assets into the fiat economy. So the goal for this panel is really to provide different use cases and allow the panelists to discuss their work in the space of blockchain. While some questions might be answered by more than one panelist, a lot of the time you'll see questions really specific to the panelists and what they're working on right now. We hope that this panel provides a greater perspective on the three companies represented and their individual focuses. So this doesn't mean, panelists, that you can't actively engage with each other or even answer questions or add comments or even disagree. I mean, we really want to hear your perspective when the other is, when everyone else is talking. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to Richard, who will speak primarily about identity and blockchain, but also about the tokenization of assets. He will also speak briefly about central bank digital currencies. Thank you for that introduction. I also wanted to mention, I spent my first 20 years of my career in banking, so I'm actually a banker. Um, and both in uh, commercial banking, consumer banking, as well as payments too. So as I was preparing for this uh, um, this panel, I really sat back and said, well, where, where could we talk about blockchain as it relates to banking? And I really wanted to talk on two issues. The first is around decentralized identity. And fundamentally, the reason for that is identity is a core foundational element to any of these use cases. Um, and the second aspect, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's happening with asset tokenization. And again, you'll see in a moment why those things, those topics actually do, um, um, those, those two topics actually do complement each other. Because if we're going to start to talk about how an asset is owned by an individual and how I allow buying and selling of that asset, I need to ensure that I understand who owns or who has custody of that asset. So that's how you can really start to see that as a foundational use case. So with that, um, why don't I get started and talk a little bit about decentralized identity. And I think you know the key with this is think about how our identities are managed today, right? We get all of these types of different uh, credentials from different institutions or agencies that we are a part of, right? You know, we get a driver's license from the DMV. We might get an ID card from our employer, right? We get a, 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 a college degree from our university, right? And really what this concept is focused on is the ability to be able to um, have those attestations that occur throughout my entire life that make up my identity available to us in a digital way that I start to control how I can share that information with others. And so as I look at uh, digital identity, I like to think about it as, first of all, it is absolutely personal. It's unique to me and only to me. It is portable. It is something that is accessible anywhere I might happen to be. And as you'll see when I talk, uh, when I show you a demo of this in a moment, it's mobile first because our mobile devices are with us in most of our everyday life. And so the ability to have that as the primary mechanism that to be able to demonstrate my identity and share that identity we think is uh, an important part of the consumer experience. It's obviously persistent. I mean, think about how often we have to re-verify our identity 
over and over to perhaps even the same institution or company. Why is that? Why do we need to continue to do that? And then lastly, it needs to be private. Think about where your identity is today. It's at your banks that you, that you work with, it's at your employer, it's at your healthcare providers. And so all of those companies and institutions are actually managing your identity on your behalf. And that's why when we open the, we turn on the news and we hear that there's been a data breach, why our hearts sink because we know that we're impacted. Well, is there a way to be able to, to change that? And so how can blockchain truly impact identity? First of all, it can, it can enable a trusted record that reduces fraud. The ability to verify those attestations that I was talking about, the ability to verify I have the college degree that I mentioned, or the ability to verify I was born in the city that I was in fact born in, for instance. It also has the ability to verify um, the identity while limiting the amount of personal identifiable information that I share. Oftentimes we get into a habit of sharing all of our uh, private information, like our name, address, uh, you know, for instance, phone, uh, phone number, email address, but is all that information necessary for whatever purpose that you are verifying your identity against is, is, um, uh, is for. And then lastly, um, this, this concept of a living identity. We are who we are because of the aggregation of all of these attestations from the moment we were born until today. You know, your first, your first form of identity was your birth certificate. And then you received your high school diploma, and then you received your college diploma, and all of the employment that you've had, you know, up until today, that all makes up your identity. And any licensure that you might have, like a professional license or a marriage license, all of those things add to your identity and get amassed over time and it becomes part of this new digital decentralized um, identity. And I think the last point here that I, that I made a moment ago that I think is really important is that digital blockchain and digital identity can provide us the ability to control our identity. Where today, um, really, we provide this information, in, in some cases, very easily. And at that point, it really becomes out of our control. So what I wanted to do next is I wanted to introduce Yosef. And so Yosef is, um, this particular video is about um, the challenge of identity for an immigrant who doesn't have formal um, aspects or availability uh, or access to you know, paper-based um, identity that we all do. And so how does, that, how does Yosef prove that he is who he says he is? And the reason why we show this, this is part of the work that Accenture has been doing as part of um, ID2020, which is a partnership with the UN and Microsoft and others. But I do think that this actually provides a bit of a perspective as to where identity is heading and where all of us may see a digital identity for opening a checking account or for applying for a job or applying for any type of auto license. So let's take a moment and meet Yosef. Who are you? This is a question that often comes up in our daily lives. Whether we're boarding a plane, checking our bank balance, or paying a utility bill, we regularly have to prove we are who we say we are. However, more than one billion people across the globe can't prove who they are with any certainty. Many of those have never had a form of verifiable ID to begin with. And more than 15 million were victims of identity theft last year alone. With this in mind, we have developed a unique digital identity prototype to modernize identity management for organizations and individuals. Leveraging the power of blockchain and biometrics, the system makes establishing, tracking, and managing digital identities more efficient, user-friendly, secure, and less open to fraud. Let's follow Yosef as he establishes and builds his identity. At an enrollment station, his biometrics are securely captured through his fingerprints, voice, face, or an iris scan. Then several steps are taken to create a unique identifier using multiple security protocols. This identifier is then recorded on the blockchain, which acts as an index with links to all applicable data. This makes it easy to locate, access, and share information without Yosef's personal data being stored on the blockchain. Using an application on his phone, Yosef creates a personal profile that's multi-factored and authentication secured. 
The app allows the user to generate his own set of public and private keys, which he can use to sign the data he sends to others. That way, third parties can be absolutely certain the information is his. Yosef shares the public key using a QR code. When he scans his QR code at the enrollment station, an official attestation is added to his profile and signed by a private key. This is the beginning of Yosef's living identity, an identity that he will build with each stamp he collects from his university, his employer, or from government and non-government agencies. The major benefit of this identity system is that Yosef is always in control of his own personal data. He determines which information is shared, who sees it, and for how long. Instead of multiple paper documents, he can use a single, easy-to-manage app. The system makes life easier for organizations too. It's interoperable with other databases, so existing identity data stays put. Efficiency for background checks is greatly improved, as an organization can choose to trust existing attestations instead of repeating the process. For additional security, there's also the option of checking data at source if the user grants permission. The system is also flexible. While this prototype has been created for a mobile device, the technology can work with or without connected devices. This prototype is the basis for our work with ID2020, a public-private partnership committed to providing a digital identity to the 1.2 billion individuals living without a way to prove their existence. We believe it's the first step towards a digital identity that makes answering the question, who are you? As simple as saying, I am. So hopefully you can see how that will fundamentally transform identity. And the, and the two areas that we're already doing work in this particular space is one is in financial services and the other is, is travel and specifically access um, as you think about crossing an in international border. Okay, so the second topic that I wanted to switch to is asset tokenization. And the way that I think about asset tokenization is it is the process of issuing a blockchain token for some asset. Um, and that asset can be money, it could be some type of a physical asset, such as equipment or even a vehicle. It can be goods, such as inventory. It can be rights, think about digital rights or even entitlements that you might have for software that you own, for instance. And what blockchain allows for these assets to be stored and managed and more easily traded than, um, than a traditional um, marketplace would today. And so it promises, the, it promises many different benefits in managing these, both the buying and the selling and the trading of these assets. Everything from reducing the transactional costs, um, strengthening the risk management, lowering barriers to entry, um, and providing greater flexibility and, and liquidity to the balance sheets, increased transparency into the ownership and the ownership history of those assets, and including uh, improving that, the customer experience around faster transactions and removing some of the friction. And when we look at assets, one of the things I mentioned is money. And what is central bank digital currency is really central bank money in token form to be able to serve these new um, uh, uh, tokenized asset um, marketplaces. So if you think about trading um, equipment uh, you know, via a token on a blockchain, why would you come out of that insane environment and use a traditional method to be able to pay for the buying and selling of that particular asset? And as you can see from this slide here, there's already different examples of this occurring within the global financial uh, marketplace. So uh, Switzerland has been focused on blockchain enabled trading and settlement. Uh, Bank of Canada, Payments Canada, and the Toronto Stock Exchange have been focused on security settlement. Um, the DTCC in the U.S. have already uh, determined that the daily uh, uh, equities volume can be settled on a blockchain. Uh, Canada, uh, Bank of Canada and the Monetary Authority of Singapore have performed cross-border um, uh, central bank digital currency exchange. We see that both uh, Sweden and China are both working on introducing their own version of a central bank digital currency. With that, I think we're on to our next speaker. Thank you, Richard. Up next, we'll hear from JC, who will give some background on the work that he's doing at Canestra with syndicated lending and blockchain. He'll go into detail about distributed ledgers and value learning. Welcome, JC. Thank you. Um, so, my angle to this event. 
event is to share with you what we've been doing for the past two and a half years. You know, many people want to work with blockchain, many people are interested in the technology, and we've been lucky to work in production with blockchain for two and a half years now. So we have a series of findings that, you know, working with bank directly in production, I would like to share with you, uh, as opposed to some proof of concept that we've been trying to put together. This is actual findings with banks. So there are many flavors of, um, of blockchains out there, and I think that the, the first thing you need to figure out is which flavor is really right for you. Um, we specifically uh, choose to go with uh, distributed ledgers, which are private and permission, because we are speaking to financial institutions that know one another, that need uh, well-established identities, as opposed to a more agnostic implementation where you could be uh, you could have public identities. Permission ledgers really are based off this notion of pre-established identities, well-known kind of parties uh, to, do the, to the inside ledger. So there are some, some common points, common DNA, between the distributed ledger and the cryptocurrencies, which is essentially the peer-to-peer -peer nature of the network, this transaction-based um, uh, protocol, as well as security. We can talk more about security after a few months. But there are also some critical differences between them, such as the way the data is aggregated. Uh, what you will find is that cryptocurrencies uh, like to aggregate transactions together into a block, hence the name, whereas ledgers don't do this aggregation layer. You will see that the distribution of the data uh, in the crypto world is broadcasting, when in the ledger world we're using private channels to send the data to well-known participants. And there's also things such as uh, how the data is validated. You've probably heard about the notion of miners in, in the crypto world, whereas in the ledger world, we use the notion of notaries and signatures. And the last thing I wanted to, to share with you is that in terms of, of cryptocurrency dependency, uh, everything that's backed by Ethereum or all the, the Bitcoin protocol in general requires a cryptocurrency to operate. So when miners create a block, sign a block, they are paid with a fraction of cryptocurrency. Whereas in the distributed ledger world, we, nobody gets paid and cryptocurrency is not part of the process. So these key differences clearly are addressing different requirements. And depending on the solution you're trying to solve, sorry, depending on the problem you're trying to solve, the solution will push you in one direction or, or another. What we found in the, in the factual industry world is that the, the cryptocurrencies were meant to disrupt banks. So initially, the reason why these cryptocurrencies were created were to bypass the middleman, bypass the banks. So we find it really hard to implement a proper financial industry use case using cryptocurrencies, whereas the, the distributed ledgers are really catering to the bank's needs, and we find it much easier to implement financial industry requirements using uh, the, the likes of Hyperledger Fabric or, or R3 Corda, for example. The, the reason why Finastra experience is relevant in that space is that Finastra is, is a fairly big company, um, and where this is making a difference is in the clients we already have today. So we have 9,000 clients today, which are essentially 9,000 banks and credit unions, which is a great platform for us to blockchain enable these existing banks. So any bank you can think of, a bigger, smaller, medium size, we're going to have them as clients, including the, the, the top banks in terms of, of asset management. So this is a great platform for us to extend their existing software with blockchain. So we are blockchain enabling their existing software. Syndicated lending is a very peculiar space in the financial industry, and I'm, I'm simplifying this a lot just to respect the format of the presentation. But basically, let's say if you are American Airlines, you want to open in Europe, you need 10 new airplanes, and for the sake of it, let's say you want to buy them cash. So this is an Everest A321, I think they cost about 100 million a pop, give or take. So to open that new route, you need a million dollars. You're going to go to your favorite bank, with uh, which you have a corporate relationship, and you're asking for that $1 billion loan. Uh, in turn, the bank will go to their pals, which are essentially all the banks, to 
try to figure out who wants to take a trash in that deal because the bank doesn't want to get full $1 million exposure in that deal. They get together, they agree on a structure, everybody gets a slice of that billion dollar. That creates the syndicate. So that syndicate will put together that money and that money will go back to American Airlines. So the relationship between the borrower and the bank is very similar to what you would have, you know, as you as a, as a borrower, the bank have this bilateral relationship. But in the background, you have this complex communication layer where all the payments flowing in, all the principal interest need to be distributed. You have lots of documents, rate settings, changing agreements that need to be communicated. And, and today, uh, that industry generates uh, 19 million faxes, mm. which is a, a stack. I, mean, if you, I, I always like to visualize this. If you, if you put these faxes together, it's a one line high stack of paper. So besides the fact we, we, we want to replace the faxes, this is a great use case for us to come with a distributed ledger and say, instead of sharing these data with paper or electronic faxes, let's put together something electronic in between so you all see a shared version of the truth, as opposed to everybody having their own copy of the truth. So th this is the distributed ledger is very relevant uh, in three spaces. Uh, there are three areas where uh, syndicate planning is very inefficient in terms of communication, which is the origination. Figure out who wants what share in the deal. So there is negotiation going on, and everybody wants to get a certain slice at a certain price. So this is where the ledger with this unified version of the truth is very relevant. There is everything involving payments. And uh, Rick touched earlier on this uh, tokenization. You could tokenize a loan. You could say, this loan is a billion dollar. I can create a token that can be split into slices and everybody gets a token in that loan. So this uh, digitized representation of the loan is a great candidate for a ledger. And the, the third point where this is, ledger makes a lot of sense is when you enter secondary trading, which is basically me as an existing lender in a deal, I want to get out, I want to sell my position in a deal. So once again, if I tokenize my position, I can transfer this to a potential buyer. Um, we, we have a couple of, of, of lessons that we learn uh, from implementing this with banks. Initially, if you look at the life cycle of a, of, of a blockchain project, initially we, we all got a hammer, just a blockchain hammer. So everybody was looking for nails, trying to figure out you know, where can we you know, use that new tool of ours. And if you look at the curve, uh, we, we basically, two and a half years ago, we were in the first place, blockchain, yay. Everybody was excited, we could speak to anyone. I think back, back then we spoke to, I think it was 48 banks and we had like 47 yeses. Everybody wanted a piece of blockchain. They didn't know what we were doing. They were blockchain and we So then we figured out that, you know what? Blockchain is a utility, it's a tool. And it turns out that nobody cares about the hammer. People care about problems. People care about solving problems. And that's where syndicated lending had real problems. The 19 million faxes, the secondary trading, the origination, these are real problems that would need to be fixed. And the reason why I'm putting this in perspective is that this whole blockchain buzzword is behind us now, and you need to consider this blockchain thing as a tool in a toolbox. And basically, if you don't offer a, a solution involving blockchain, but using blockchain as a mean, as opposed to an end, and it's very important to consider the, the problem itself, as opposed to blockchain. And I think ideally, where we want to be, and I think it's coming very quick, then eventually blockchain will completely disappear as some type of technology behind the scene that we can use to prove that we have a consensus and we don't need to reconcile data between participants. So that's the, the underlying thinking is that let's not consider that blockchain is a solution itself. It's just part of the solution. So in order to, to speed up adoption, the, the three main findings that I wanted to share with you is that when you are creating a community of participants, uh, always realize that um, it's very hard to synchronize all your participants. And uh, initially, we were trying to get everybody together, to test together. It took forever to achieve anything. It's a great thing to have a consensus, but nobody agrees on when to test what. And you end up with, in this kind of 
tall situation where everybody is willing one another. So even though we're talking about a distributed ledger, it's very important that your testing with your clients is scanned. They can test on their own with more participants or automated trading, something automatic. Don't expect them to be all available at the same time. That will save you a lot of time. The second finding is that we try to deploy a blockchain inside a bank firewall, and it turns out that the implementation was terrible. Banks are used to configure firewall point-to-point -point connection, and they will never allow a peer-to-peer -peer protocol inside the firewall. They're configuring a static list of whitelisted IP addresses, meaning if you consider that peer-to-peer -peer is inside a bank, you're probably overlooking the fact that they are implementing it in a static way. So the only way to deploy a peer-to-peer -peer protocol inside big corporations is to use the cloud. You cannot install blockchain behind a firewall without making some compromise. So if you're in the architecture phase or design phase, bear that in mind. There are technical solutions to make it look like it works, but it doesn't work. It only works on a static basis, it's not dynamic. And the, the third point is that uh, DLT is a small portion of the big equation, um, and you know you need you need to come with something that actually connects the legacy system into the ledger, and the ledger is only the consensus component of a bigger solution. So distributed ledgers are really good at establishing a, a common source of truth between the participants, and make sure that we don't have to reconcile the data. Once we have an agreement, we store that. It's kind of a smaller database if you want. So we have this unified database that shared with participants. But it is by no means a solution of its own. So just put that in perspective, the DLT is a utility, it's not man. And I think these are the, the three biggest findings that um, I, I'm happy to share with you. There is a lot more that we could discuss on this topic. Uh, in this format, uh, 10 minutes, I think that's, I just want to give you an appetite that there's more behind it, if you have questions, don't hesitate. But these are the most important findings, I think, for that, uh, that session. Thank you, JC. Um, turning gears a little bit, we're going to hear from Eric, who's going to talk about the challenges with on-ramp and off-ramp. Um, cryptos going from fiat to crypto, crypto fiat money. Let's welcome. Mike, Mike, welcome. Okay. Uh, so it's it's fun to be here today. You can tell I'm a software guy. Blue Jeans. Uh, so, uh, my name is Eric Smith. I'm the founder and CEO of App Brilliance. Uh, we're a small company. We are, we are not the third largest fintech company in Europe. Um, and we don't have the largest banks, 48 of the 50 banks as our customers. We are an uh, early stage company. We're, we're out of Austin, Texas. And our font is unreadable. <laughs> Yeah, as soon as a PDF, hopefully that wouldn't happen, but um, that's okay. I will actually read the slide, even though you're not supposed to do that. Um, so, yeah, so we're based out of Austin, Texas. We are trying to solve some really, really significant uh, problems with cryptocurrencies. So who here has bought or sold cryptocurrencies in the past? Yay, majority. Okay. Was that fun and easy? Yeah, no, it, it kind of sucks. So, um, yeah, getting money from USD or Euro or whatever into an exchange or you know doing something where you can then get your digital asset and then being able to convert that back into something you can buy a latte with is uh, hard. And so we're trying to solve that problem. We think it's a big problem. So uh, I'm going to talk about liquidity, and uh, I went to Investopedia and looked up what they think liquidity is. So they describe it as the degree to which an asset or security can be quickly bought or sold in the market at a price reflecting its intrinsic value, in other words, the ease of converting it to cash. So a lot of folks in uh, the crypto space will talk about liquidity from the perspective of can they make a market 
Can they convert, you know, can they uh, give you a, an efficient quote on the price of a given crypto asset? Are there willing buyers and, and sellers within the marketplace? That's not what I'm focused on or what we're focused on in terms of liquidity. We're talking about the ability to go from a fiat currency into a cryptocurrency and doing that in the, with the least amount of possible friction uh, and then similarly being able to reverse that process in a frictionless way. So, uh, again, the, the font here is wonderful. Um, so, converting uh, from cash into cryptos and back, I think, is, is honestly the biggest issue facing cryptocurrency adoption and mainstreaming uh, today. Uh, there are a lot of issues, but I think this is, is frankly the biggest one. Um, it, it involves the difficulty moving from a dollar into Bitcoin, bit, Bitcoin back to a dollar. And in, inside the software space and the cryptocurrency space, we call this the on-ramp, off-ramp problem. So economics 101, right? Uh, these things create friction. Uh, friction increases costs uh, and lowers adoptions, right? So if you make it harder to uh, open a trading account, if you make it harder for uh, your grandmother to buy, you know, to buy some cryptos on the side, or you know, diversify her investment portfolio, uh, those things increase cost and uh, radically reduce adoption. And you can see that in the fact that the vast, despite the fact that roughly half the people in the room have bought cryptos, the other half haven't, and this is kind of a selected market. Right, uh, in terms of the sample size in this room. I doubt you would be here if you hadn't at least thought about it. Um, but from a mainstream US perspective, a tiny, tiny percentage of people have even done this. So if we're looking into the future uh, and trying to prognosticate like where cryptos are going, uh, some of the key technologies need to be the things that make it accessible. So some of us in the audience are old enough to remember when the internet first came out, right? And first, you know, you got, you've got mail and AOL and all that kind of good stuff, right? We're basically at that stage. So this is the 1996 of cryptos and, 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 and blockchain technologies in general. So a tiny fraction of people are doing it. It's gotten a lot of, uh, it's gotten a lot of uh, press, a lot of people are talking about it. But the future is, is really, you know, 20 fold, 100 fold in terms of adoption of where we are today. So, totally unbelievable. I apologize. So, if you're going to go from fiat currencies or uh, whatever to uh, cryptos, you've got a few options. So, we've got a couple slides talking about that. So, that is supposed to say AC to wire transfers, right? So, if you bought cryptos today, um, there's a good chance that after you went through your KYC and ML process, you did some form of an ACH transfer or a wire transfer into the crypto exchange, and then you bought your crypto asset from that. Um, if you're in banking, of course, this is this is what your industry is based on. This, the, this is how interinstitutional money is moving. Um, problem with wires and, and ACH from a consumer perspective, especially ACH, is that it's slow. There's a tremendous lack of visibility on both ends of the transaction. So I know that I sent it, but how do you know that I sent it? You don't know until you receive it, right? Uh, and that um, that results in basically, you know, there's not enough trust and there's not enough control. There's not enough trust because if you're an exchange and I tell you I've sent you money, you don't believe it until you see it. Uh, there's not enough control because if you're an exchange and I give you the credentials with which to extract the money from my account, um, you have to wait around for the for the money to show up. You don't know that the money is good at the time you, you make the withdrawal, you have to wait for it to post. So this uh, creates a tremendous amount of friction in the space. Uh, so a lot of times the way this is exposed with an exchange is if you want to buy cryptos, uh, you will need to ACH or wire transfer money in and it can take five business days before you can transfer the cryptos out of the account or they'll let you trade them. And so that is not great, but it's cheap. It's not expensive to do. Uh, your other option uh, is you could use debit and credit rates, right? So these are great because they're real time. But the problem is, is that any link in the payment processing chain can break the ability for you, for the consumer to purchase or, you know, on ramp or off ramp using those systems. So uh, if the payment processor doesn't like it, that's bad. If Visa, Amex, MasterCard, et cetera, don't like it, then they can block it. If the bank that issues the credit or debit card doesn't like it, 
they can block it. And there's, I'm sure we'll get into this afterwards perhaps, but I mean, there's a lot of reasons why these things happen. But the end result is a really, really terrible user experience that doesn't uh, lend itself to the mainstreaming of cryptos as an investment class or as an asset in general. So, uh, so there's also, assuming you can get the transaction to go through, there's very, very high fees on these transactions, right, which further re uh, reduce adoption and increase friction. So uh, anybody bought cryptocurrencies on a credit card or debit card? One person, okay. So uh, this is super, super expensive. I hope you did it as just an experiment to see what it would be like. Yeah, yeah. so they can charge, uh, these, these are not very transparent, and people can end up accidentally uh, paying as high as 14% fees, uh, which is nuts. Uh, but at least it's faster than ACH. So if you can get it to go through, as frustrating as terrible that is, uh, at least it's theoretically in real time. All right, so then there's the other option, which is what I'm, what I'm doing. Uh, which is our software, which we uh, sell as an SDK, and we license to trusted partners. So our stuff is real time. Uh, it gives full visibility on both sides of the transaction. So uh, it's both push and pull. So I, as the user, can see what's in my account, and I'm giving permission to move the money. And the technology company that integrates the SDK can both see both sides of the transaction and actually control my side to push the money out. So the result of that is, uh, you know, full visibility on both ends of the transaction. It's basically both push and pull with full control, and we monetize it by charging a flat 1.79% fee, uh, which then is turned into a split with the exchange. This does not go over payment rates. This is not Visa MasterCard. So it also works with any bank. Uh, the downside, because there is always a downside, is that it requires a trusted technology company to integrate with my technology. So uh, the good news is the bank doesn't have to integrate with my technology, or else this would never happen. <laughs> so uh, all it takes is somebody like Binance or, or Coinbase or something to integrate that, and then we're off to the races. So why do we care about this? And again, we care because the opportunity is staggering. You know, today there are maybe, if we're being generous, maybe 10 million active uh, crypto investors, and most of this is speculation. Um, this is not, you know, a mainstream situation yet. Uh, but there's over 230 million people that have U.S. banking accounts in the U.S. and there's four trillion dollars in banks. So if we're looking in terms of orders of magnitude, in terms of problem, uh, as a space, as a software company that we can look at, uh, at working in, we think this is huge because uh, the bottom line is there's a few key software things that can be done to enable that transition, to enable. Uh, cryptos and the sort of mainstreaming of this asset class that both addresses some banking issues as well as payments. Uh, and that is a story for another day because that's more than seven minutes. Um, but we do address that. And we do think it is, uh, that is uh, one of the biggest stories in terms of being able to uh, make it easier and, uh, and more straightforward for people to uh, trade in and out of cryptos in a, in a efficient, safe, secure, cheap, and legal way. So, I guess that's it. Okay, test, test, okay. So we heard lots of different perspectives about many different things. Um, now we're gonna get more into the question part of it. Uh, like I said, the questions are semi-individualized, but we'll see how. Our panelists decided to jump in. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about really is challenges with each of your uh, projects. So I'm going to start with Richard. Why is digital identity in this world of blockchain so important, and what does that look like for companies? Yeah, I think the, the reason why it uh, is so important is it's just the foundational use case. I mean, if we think about a lot of the use cases that we've talked about here, it's about uh, buying or selling or exchanging a value. And so fundamentally, at its core, you need to know who you're transacting with and being able to verify that it is who they say they are. Otherwise, you'll have unauthorized transactions, and that will generate a number of other significant problems. I think what's interesting around thinking about distributed identity versus the way that the identity is managed today is that this provides us as individuals more control over our identity. 
and we get to choose what information we want to share with whom and for how long. And I think ultimately, I think this should help us reduce the amount of times that we have to revalidate ourselves with that same provider as well, which obviously um, does, is not the optimal customer experience. I mean, we've all been on a, on a phone call with someone that we work with, um, you know, even as a consumer, maybe a, a service provider, and you're having to revalidate you know, who you are in order to get you know, some type of an issue addressed or some type of a, a service performed. So, and I think from a banking perspective, I see this as paramount for payments. I see this as paramount for any type of asset exchange. Um, I think also from a KYC perspective, we think about re-verifying you know, the partners that we even work with from a, uh, from a business perspective. I think all of these are wrapped around this identity, identity issue. So what does an identity look like for an organization? Does it just for people or can, there, can anything have an identity? How does that work? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You're getting into my IoT space. So I like to, um, you know, I, when I think about IoT and the Internet of Things, I mean, depending on the, in, the what research you review, you know, there's going to be somewhere between 50 to 60 billion connected devices by the end of next year. That actually is five to six times more um, devices than credit cards that have been issued. So fundamentally, these devices will play a role in commerce. And so this is the space that I'm actively working on within Accenture today. And one of the areas that I spend a lot of time thinking about is vehicles. Because connected vehicles are very, very large and sophisticated IoT devices. And becoming more sophisticated, it seems like, every model year. And so I constantly think about when I'm pulling out of a parking lot, why do I need to stop and pull a credit card out of my wallet? Why can't my car communicate with the parking lot and just pay for me? Well, in order for that to work, identity comes back into play again. I need to understand that that a car is authentic. I need to understand who has custody or ownership of that car. And I need to understand that the data that I'm looking at is coming from that car. If I am not confident of those three things, if I accept that payment, I'm taking a risk that it might be an unauthorized payment. Well, I want to contribute that uh, on, on the identity space, there is a very interesting notion of disposable identity that's uh, shaping up. Um, Hyperledger Indy is, is pushing that idea that uh, you would own multiple identities that you would issue on a purely basis. So let's say if you have a relationship with uh, two or three banks, you would issue yourself your own sub-identity with these banks, and you would use every individual identity in that context. And you could revoke that identity. So instead of using the same password it would show over and over, you would use specialized identity credential within that context. And these all new things, I mean, we've never used that before, it's a disposable IT as an exist. It's very interesting because then you can you really control who can see what and you control the issuance and the revocation of the identity, which I think is a very interesting concept. So for JC, um, what are some of the unseen adoption challenges with DLT? I think that in general, in the in, in the in everything that involves encryption today uh, is is ripe for disruption. In the sense that right now we are projecting everything around uh, encryption, which basically every time we have a new version of encryption, we are building hiding the data behind a brick wall. And with every iteration, we raise that wall with a, with a couple of bricks. And then there's a real challenge coming up, which is that once uh, quantum computing reaches supremacy, somebody's going to come up with a satellite picture, and we can't hide the data anymore. So we're building higher walls, and somebody can see everything, because they have so much computing power, that they can break that cryptography very easily. And I think that's a coming challenge that you need to consider that the distributed nature of the data and the fault tolerance is actually more important than how we secure the data itself. So I think that's a, this this is probably something that's going to come up in a week or a month that somebody achieved that quantum supremacy and can break our existing protocol in a matter of seconds. Um, for Eric, what are some examples of barriers to mainstream participation in crypto investments or payments? And then what are the costs of these barriers? Uh, I think one of the, the big barriers is that uh, you can't pay for things, you can't buy cryptos. Generally in the United States, you can't buy uh, and sell cryptos easily using debit for um, 
you know, there's, uh, that's generally just not something that's available to US mainstream exchanges. Coinbase has uh, the ability to do that uh, for certain banks and certain types of transactions. Um, but people don't understand that. I mean, we've become so quickly a cashless society where, I mean, I don't have cash in my wallet, right? And I think most of us don't. We pay, we pay for everything with debit and credit cards or Apple, Apple Pay or whatever. And so when people are faced with the reality that they can't use those instruments to buy or sell uh, cryptos, that is a huge barrier. And that's very, uh, and that's, that's sort of anti-consumer in terms of getting them on it because they don't, it's not obvious going in to it that there's going to be all that friction. Uh, and I think, a, you know, a, there's a substantial abandonment rate, right, as people move through the process that, that are interested in owning it or interested in participating in some way or using it as an alternative form of payment or something like that. And then they get into it and they, they the, the brick wall analogy, right, the, it's like they clear one wall and the next wall's higher and the next wall's higher at a certain point they just say, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mess with this right now. So I, I think that's one of the, the biggest barriers um, is, the, is the lack of ability for consumers to, to use the debit credit cards. So I want to talk a little bit about how this technology plays in with businesses, plays into the real world. Um, for Richard, how will the emerging token-based financial market infrastructure impact banking and finance? Yeah, I think the first thing to think about is what I was talking about with asset tokenization. As more and more assets become tokenized, the ability to exchange those assets, buying and selling and, and transferring them between different parties, whether they be individuals or companies or what have you, becomes far more streamlined. If we think about asset transfer, value transfer today, whether it be payment, whether it be the sale of stock, or maybe even a sale of vehicle, right? Those processes, the asset typically moves in a different process than paying for the asset. And I think what is interesting around what blockchain provides is when we have this, uh, this fundamental platform that allows the asset to be recorded um, within that environment, and we have immutability, we have uh, uh, the ability to kind of manage for duplicate transactions, we have clear ownership, title, et cetera, that blockchain can provide that level of transparency. It only makes sense that the, the ability to pay for that is also within that same infrastructure. I mean, if you think about having say, a, a share of stock on, uh, you know, being tokenized, would you really want to then allow for that to be paid to a traditional banking transaction? You're actually introducing a new form of settlement risk. And I think that's what I think is interesting here is the convergence of um, the ability to tokenize these assets, but then as we're starting to see the uh, you know, token-based uh, um, uh, central bank money also coming to the marketplace that allows for this new type of transaction. And ultimately, it allows for what I call an atomic transaction, which is there's instant real-time settlement between both parties rather than having to wait you know, several days. I mean, if I were to hand you a $20 bill, that transaction's fine at that moment, right? In most other payments that we have within the global payment system today, you know, there, there's a notification of the payment that's followed by the entry of uh, actually uh, moving that money, and then the next day somebody comes in and balances. And so you have all that friction associated with that mechanism today, and fundamentally. Um, we are, for all these new layer software, we are issuing new identities. So it's, uh, it's, it's a new iteration of the identities, and when we connect the legacy software to the blockchain, we have a mapping layer that transfers uh, everything that's in legacy terms into the this globally unique directory. So in our case, where we have uh, one instance of our legacy software with all our clients, all living in their own bubble, once we transpose them on the blockchain world, we issue one identity per participant, and we are transforming the legacy ID into the blockchain globally unique identifier, and then they go through that, which allows them to speak to one another. But they, you, you cannot remove the existing ID. The legacy software is here to stay for a couple of years. So you need to have this mapping layer in the interim that transfers from you know, your previous identifier mechanism into the global unique uh, directory. So the database is a big part of it. And if I can add, I think, um, I think we're seeing a little bit of both. I think
think where there is some common standards within a particular industry uh, process, for instance, the ability to kind of look at those standards and say, is that the basis of starting to move that onto a blockchain? But at its core, what a blockchain is really about is it's about transformation. It's about transforming an existing process and typically an industry process. I mean, blockchain is a team sport. There's very little value in using blockchain with the four walls of your company. It's really around using it within an, in, in, within an ecosystem. And so from that perspective, it's about re-looking at that process. It's not about taking your existing analog process and putting it onto a blockchain. It's about fundamentally rethinking that process with that ecosystem and re-engineering it from start to finish, leveraging the capabilities of the technology. So in many cases, you might start with some standards that exist in the marketplace, but use that only from more of a data governance perspective to get started, and then think about how that process will change. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I've seen, uh, you know, one of the areas that Accenture's worked on is cross-border trade and the documentation associated with those transactions when you think about bills of lading, letters of credit, et cetera. I've actually seen examples in the market where there are solutions where they're just taking the existing documentation and putting them on the blockchain. That's not the process we're talking about here. It's fundamentally thinking about all of the data elements that are common on those documents. Who needs access to them? And how do you fundamentally get access and provide that capability to that ecosystem to change the process and remove the paper altogether? Do you see banking as the core to this ecosystem in, in many ways, or do you see something else to be sort of? <clears throat> Sorry, do you see what is that? Banking, finance, payments to be the core for leveraging the identity of the evolution. Yeah. Others. Um, when people ask me, you know, what do I think is the most transformative aspect of blockchain, I immediately go to payments. And it's because of the example I just provided with the $20 bill. Our entire global banking system is primarily based on an IOU. And fundamentally at the core, what this technology allows for is a direct exchange of value between two participants. And from that perspective, it will change every movement of value that's in the marketplace today. And that's where I see it will change the world. That's just my point. I'll jump on that. Um, so I I look at it a little differently, I guess. I do see banking as the as the core to this. Um, it's again from a consumer's perspective, from a from a retail economic perspective, um, that's where the money is, right? Um, and we all have to go through a fairly extensive process to be able to qualify for a bank account in the first place. We have to show our documents. Um, we have to go through the KYC and AML. If we deposit more than $10,000, we go through the, I mean, all these things are already regulated. Um, frankly, I think that that's one of the weaknesses of the way that Facebook rolled out their Libra stuff. They did not put banking at the core of that. Um, and so it raised a lot of uh, regulatory flags um, and trust flags. That also came from Facebook. Um, <laughs> but so, so we have uh, infrastructure. Now, not everybody in the world has access to that infrastructure, but a substantial percentage of the US population does have access to it. And so we've already gone through um, a process of knowing those customers and having those customers qualify. And that's also what happens to be where the money is right now for those customers. So we can build, I think that there is, um, the path forward that is gonna be the fastest path is a hybrid path that builds off of that as its foundational layer. Um, and I think that in order to get to where we ultimately want to go, which is this sort of atomic exchanges of value and, and the complete sort of uh, virtualization of economic value uh, away from just central, uh, central bank currencies, is you have to have a hybrid strategy, right? You, you have to be able to buy the water or buy the latte. Um, and the, the, first, the first step is to get as many people on these accountable tokenized platforms uh, and I, I don't mean tokenized from necessarily from a blockchain perspective, but from a, from a payments perspective. To get people on those platforms, uh, to get them um, using the next generation tools and then have consensus around those platforms in the sense of having large tipping point, uh, you know, from an Apple Pay perspective or Google Pay perspective, having many, 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 many millions of consumers on those platforms and um, a substantial percentage of merchants that accept them. And those, I think, then create sort of this uh, a series of gates that can get us ultimately where we want to go. Um, 
but yeah, I do. I I happen to see, and I'm, I'm basing my business around the fact that banking is sort of central to that. I actually have a quick question for you, Eric. So, what do you think is standing between where we are today and a massively adopted stable coin? So, just to, to, to make it tangible, let's say if I want to send a hundred dollars to everybody in the room, mm -hmm. and they're going to be able to accept it right away. What is standing between where we are now and that? The ability to go from the hundred dollars you have in your wallet uh, or the in your bank account to being able to purchase that stable coin in real time, and the ability for everybody who receives it to be able to convert it to something that can buy that latte. Does that need to be a government issue? Federal coin? No. It, 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 in, my, in my opinion, it has to, it just has to address the, it has to frequently address the on-ramp offering problem. So if you can, if you can solve that technologically, where basically anybody that has a bank account or a credit card or debit card can participate in that economic, that, uh, that transaction in a way that's similar to the way consumers would do a normal retail transaction, then I think that is the first step toward mainstreaming. And then if you can't meet that challenge, then you're not gonna you're not gonna get there. So you say that we all have used our existing bank accounts and we just crypto is just a way to use that money? Yeah, so uh, it we from first principles we all have bank accounts. Well, that's my theory. Is we're starting off of that first. So we all have regulated bank accounts already, we all have money in those accounts, and then there could be a series of benefits uh, to the consumer or to the businesses to adopting stable coins or some central bank currencies or other alternative currencies uh, as a method of payment or the method of remittance. Um, but let's start where, where the trillions of dollars already are, which is in fiat currencies, and then figure out how to make that easy to get into and out of it and, and incentivize the consumers and the businesses to adopt. The, the biggest incentive, uh, what's the quote, the, the greatest trick the devil pulled is uh, convincing men he didn't exist, right? And so uh, the devil in this case is Visa. Right. So, you know, there's a 3% tax on all goods and services in the United States that, that's sold at retail. So, 3% uh, doesn't sound like a lot, but it's an astronomical percentage of the profit margin for a lot of businesses, right? Um, especially in today's global economy where the, the friction is just op that's been optimized out. So, if you could remove that 3% global tax on, on retail transactions by disintermediating the the payment networks, then that's huge, right? That's an enormous amount of incentive. So how do you go from where we are, right, to a system where you can remove that friction, remove that middleman, uh, using some sort of stable coin or crypto asset class as a way of doing that? Um, and I, I think there's a technical path forward. It just, it, um, yeah, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going into a lot of detail on that. <laughs> I would say if you have a question, just go up to the mic. Yeah, just up to the mic. Hi, I'm Carol Holman. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, you know, it just seems like it's going in a circle um, in terms of currency. So if you have one currency in Nigeria and one currency in the UK and one currency in Canada and, and the US and everybody goes to a a new currency, what happens to the world currencies around the world in terms of conversion rates and that? Do you just make a flat world and there's one currency everywhere with that asset being shared or purchased or sold? Does it just flatten out all the currencies in the world? Who wants to take that one? We tried to do that in Europe by giving the same currency to everyone. <laughs> That doesn't work that way. So <laughs> you want to be able to devaluate your currency to look like you're in good shape. When you look at markets outside of you know where the US dollar or euro are prevalent, oftentimes when you're exchanging between two currencies, you actually have to use a metal currency to do so. Right. And so and that obviously raises the time, the friction, and the cost of doing that transaction. So the interesting aspect around this is, does this technology actually allow for markets to be created between those currencies that today there just isn't enough transactions to, to warrant a direct exchange? And so I think that's one way to maybe think about how this technology
technology could even help us some time. Short term. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have two questions. I'll make them very quick. Uh, JC, first one's for you. Uh, you said something that sparked my interest. You said that you know, next week or next month there could possibly be a quantum computer that breaks you know uh, our standard uh, encryption uh, protocols like SHA-256 or something like that. Um, what makes you so confident in such a short time horizon? And um, have you looked into quantum signatures and short resistance and stuff like that? So the, the issue we have with quantum computing right now is it's stable. Once we achieve supremacy, we have predictable results. And today, if the quantum computing was predictable, you would break TLS 1.3 in 41 seconds. So once you achieve a repeatable result with quantum computing, you can break any key you want in less than a minute. So that's already, the technology is there. It's not stable yet, but it's there. So the problem we have is that access to technology is very expensive, but I think there was something that came up this week saying that uh, Google was already looking into this, maybe they achieved something already. So we're very close to, to breakthrough. There is a singularity that will happen pretty soon. Now, it's not widely available, so we're still safe, but we, it's within reach, it's very close. That's very interesting. Because my thought on this was always that if someone was able to break it in a short time frame, it would be like the Manhattan Project. You know, it would be equivalent to the nuclear bomb being invented, right? But maybe it won't happen. And maybe private companies will just reach the singularity at a similar time and be able to do it. Uh, so thank you for your comments. Uh, I'll just ask one more quick question to, to Eric. Uh, you talked about um, something that I agree with. You said that there has to be one platform where all vendors and users and services can kind of integrate into that has a stable coin. Uh, that, that describes Libra. Um, do you think Libra could uh, possibly be a winner here? No. <laughs> why not? Uh, it's true to a poison tree, I guess. Uh, it, they, they've, they've bundled that. I apologize to anybody on Facebook in the audience. I'm still for sale if anybody wants to bundle. <laughs> But they bundled that pretty badly, right? And and they've they've set things back uh, in some ways. They've set they they the, the, I mean, just look at the regulatory scrutiny and the oversight that has happened since the announcement. And so, in some ways, that's good, right? It, it shines a light on it, and hopefully, at the other end of this side, um, if you believe in Western style democracy, we'll have better we'll have a better outcome and and um, a stronger system. But maybe that won't happen, and probably won't happen. So I, I, I don't think that, um, that, that, that that project has, it, it is going to work uh, as it's currently constituted. I, what I would do if I was them is, is sort of declare victory and reformulate that project under a different, a, a different strategy. Um, maybe even change the name of it or something. But yeah, it's, it's, it's getting a tremendous amount of regulatory and industry pushback. Um, so, but I think something like that, something like that, that, that wasn't necessarily as founding members focusing on Visa and MasterCard and instead, you know, focused on the banks around the world, maybe. Apple wow. Coin. Yeah, sure, yeah. Or Google Coin or, or something, or Amazon Coin. Actually, we already are using Amazon Coin, right? I'm sorry. Like, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for so many people. But that's the kind of point I'm talking about, the tipping points, right? I mean, pretty much everybody in this room is a member of at least one of four networks, and probably four of four networks. Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon. And so when you start looking at the Venn diagram of the consumers, and they're, they're, the, those consumers have bank accounts, and they also have payment cards, and they have these uh, tokenized digital wallets, and they're cross-connected and massively uh, scalable network inf infrastructures, and then those infrastructures are then tied into this massively scalable sort of merchant fabric. Um, all of the ingredients are there. Uh, it just requires sort of um, that next level of adoption. There are some substantial, even though we are all wired for it, I'm sure everybody in here has a smartphone, we all have a mobile wallet. Um, but only 1% of retail transactions went over those mobile wallets and 80% of us don't have a card in them yet. So, we're, we're, the groundwork has been laid. I think, 
you know, it might not be as soon as the quantum singularity or whatever, but it's soon. In the next five years, I think we're going to start reaching an accelerating tipping point uh, where those uh, four ecosystems can start creating economic incentives uh, for people to take payments uh, or to stay on rails within those systems. Um, and then you're going to see a rapid uh, destabilization in a, in a disruptive sort of tech way. Uh, of of the traditional payment systems, and I, and I think that that is going to the only heir apparent to that right now is a is a sort of a suit, you know semi stable coin type of uh, decentralized system. Um, but anyway, if I can add to that, I think what's interesting about Libra is, is really I look at it from two perspectives. One, the fact that it's permission versus permissionless. One of the challenges with Bitcoin is. You know, who are you going to call when you lose a, you know, a password, for instance? And where is the form of governance that, that um, you know, looks after how it will be used? And the Libra Association is starting to push on that idea. So I think that's an interesting development. I think the other side of this is you know, what Bitcoin lacks is utility. Um, and the currency at its core, it needs utility. And that utility comes from usage from consumers having access to it, but then more importantly, merchant acceptance. And I think that's what's also interesting here is the aspect that it's both a stable coin, so the volatility should hopefully be you know, far less than what you see with something like Bitcoin. But then also, to Eric, to your point around these networks, the ability to tap into these networks and even some of the initial um, partners of Libra Association provides a pretty broad network of use. And ultimately, does that increase its utility? So I think there's a couple. So I look at it as a as a step in the right direction. That you have permission, you have um, utility is being focused on with with um, with Libra versus what you know what Bitcoin um, what Bitcoin is today. So just in my perspective. Um, I, I think so. Let me make a like a very specific prediction. So I think in the next five years, what we're going to see is a hybridization. So I think we're going to remain fiat for big purchases. Um, and then what we're going to start seeing the initial disruption in terms of taking points and from retail uh, credit card transactions. So I think that's what makes the most sense. That's where there's the most friction in terms of economic incentive to disintermediate Visa and MasterCard. You're not buying cars typically or houses or boats with Visa and MasterCard. Uh, but you are buying lattes and waters and Big Macs. And so I think we're going to start there. And that's one of the reasons we're focused on you know, the bank being the, the central platform for where the value is stored in your fiat currency. And making it easy to get into and out of that fiat currency and some type of cryptocurrency as an intermediate form of exchange with merchants. But I, I don't think, I don't see, at least in, in, in in uh, most established world econ uh, economic zones, that people are going to be keeping their, uh, they're not going to be overly exposed, I don't think, to a stable coin or any cryptocurrency as, the, as their fi the primary financial asset. Um, I think that that's going to be used as an intermediate form of payment uh, to disintermediate credit cards. I'm going to disagree. I'm going to say it's going to be used for institutional transfers first, and I point to some of the central bank digital currencies and even JPM coin. Yeah, I mean, you have from private networks or mission networks that can be utilized, um, and they're really focused on the benefits of that atomic transaction versus the friction associated with the traditional way of selling today. Yeah, I agree. But I mean, you could you could have trillions of dollars being moved over those systems with. Ten banks adopting it, right? And there's that's a, there's a fundamental difference between that and a billion people using it. So, so I, you know, sure on the back end, you know, you could you could say it's being used for inter 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 interinstitutional or international transfers, but you know, for the average Joe public, that doesn't, you know, that's not. Anyway, I'm sorry. Yeah. I want to make sure we have time to get to the last two questions. Um, Either one. Good. Oh, so my question is about, so um, you mentioned payments. So for example, 
I think right now in Europe there's a regula regulation about PSD2 rolling out, payments for respective to, and it's about secure authentication. Mm -hmm. It's being solved by like a traditional technology to be secure. But the question is, it seems like the regulators are already rolling out regulations to kind of constrain the solution space. So especially like the big companies like A Capture Essential, when you guys are rolling out, you're trying to reinvent solutions. Maybe you talk a bit about how we how are you navigating the existing regulations and regu regula you know, regula regula regulators, right? Isn't that a big Roadblock to getting these things in production? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think, you know, it, with any of these types of blockchain projects, as I mentioned earlier, it takes, it's an ecosystem, right? It's a, it's a team sport. And so thinking about that ecosystem and being very strategic around who you engage with in order to redesign that process is a really important part of ensuring that your project ultimately has success and that you ultimately realize the value pool, you know, the value that you're going after. And I think you know involving the regulators in that process is a really important part of the process. I completely agree with that, but that's a side note. Um, this is for Eric. So I bought something on Overstock a week ago, and it gave me the option to buy with Bitcoin, which I didn't choose to do. But throughout this conversation, I've been thinking, okay, what if I purchase this item with Bitcoin, and then I decide I want to return it? and the value of Bitcoin has changed since the time I bought it. What's the current situation, and then what do you predict would be, um, I guess, a de-risked version of that in the future um, if everyone were to be kind of on the stable coin? So, um, I'm not sure how they would address that. I think every vendor has a different policy about that today. Okay. Um, and you know you need to delve quickly into that or deeply into that in terms of if you're going to use something that is uh, that is fluctuates in value as a as a form of payout. That's why I think a lot of folks are focused on the stable coins as the as the transactional medium. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's sort of a, a necessary aspect of it. Uh, is is you know if you're going to use it as, a, as an alternative form of payment from Visa and Mastercard for whatever reason, if you're going to do that, it needs to be in a predictable way, um, so that if you you know if you have a, if it's a thousand dollar couch and you give a thousand dollar flurbos or a thousand flurbos to it, that you need to get a thousand flurbos back. That's worth a thousand dollars, right? When you return it minus some sort of transactional fee. Um, but uh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I think that's a big barrier why people, a lot of people aren't taking Bitcoin. Right. I don't think Overstock is taking that risk. <laughs> That'd be surprising there. But there's what do you mean with the ability to pay in Bitcoin? No, no, taking the risk of that, 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 that if, you, if they return, yeah. keeping you whole, yeah, that's probably they're, for you. They're probably converting it dollar denominated. So, so at that point, they're, they're probably saying this thing is at this instant of time worth whatever, yes. some fraction of however many Bitcoin. Yeah. And, and so they're, it's US dollar denominator or euro denominator or something like that. You just happen to be able to transfer them an equivalent amount of Bitcoin. When you return it, they're going to give you that equivalent amount of Bitcoin back for that dollar denomination. I think it's the higher or I was right. going to say, because that depending on the fluctuation, you really mess them up. But thank right. you. Not, not that I'm advocating this, but there was a pretty famous story about someone bought a Ferrari for $350. Because when they purchased the Bitcoin, it was three hundred fifty dollars, and yeah. when they sold it, they bought Ferrari. Yeah, like I'm not allocating this. The ten thousand dollar pizza. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. For sure. So we we do have time for one more question. If anybody wants to step up. Hello, Ben Wilson. Um, my question is more for Richard. Uh, you mentioned about the identity, uh, how the companies are using the blockchain. My question is, what's the interface between to put the data in the system? Because as I think I see your, uh, saw your uh, presentation, that the laptop, that you put your fingers, so you can interface there. But the big question is, uh, if you're using blockchain, to use more uh, uh, supply chain solution or fire, fire trade, something like this, how can we uh, put the right information in the system? Because it seems like it's safe before the one computer, be safe there. But uh, how can we make sure that the information is there? Yeah. Uh, like, for example, diamonds or coffee yeah. bags or something like this. Yeah, so that, that's a great question, um, and I'm glad you asked it. Is that, you know, obviously, you know, it's one thing to have secure data in a blockchain, but how do you get the, 
the data in the blockchain to be verified to begin with. And I actually think that's really where the intersection of blockchain and IoT can play a significant role, especially as we think about kind of supply chains and the ability for those IoT devices to contribute that data. Because if we're still relying on human entry of that data into the blockchain, then there still is the potential to either have things mistyped or more nefarious activities of fraud. And so I think I really see that IoT and blockchain can also provide this complementary ability um, to be able to get data into the blockchain and verify as, you know, let's say a product is moving through a supply chain, for instance. Great question. Please join me in thanking Sonia, Richard, Casey, and Eric.